do not laugh. But once upon a time, my crest has long since fallen, I had a mind to make a body of more or less connected legend, ranging from the large and cosmogonic to the level of romantic fairy story, the larger founded on the lesser in contact with the earth, the lesser drawing splendor from the vast backcloths, which I could dedicate simply to, to England, to my country. It should possess the tone and quality that I desired, something cool and clear, be redolent of our air, the clime and soil of the Northwest, meaning Britain and the hither parts of Europe, not Italy or the Aegean, still less the East, and while possessing, if I could achieve it, the fair elusive beauty that some call Celtic, though it is rarely found in genuine ancient Celtic things. It should be high, purged of the gross, and fit for the more adult mind of a land long now steeped in poetry. I would draw some of the great tales in fullness and leave many only in the scheme, only placed in the scheme and sketched. The cycles should be linked to a majestic whole and yet leave scope for other minds and hands, wielding paint and music and drama. Absurd. Welcome, I'm Professor Rachel Fulton Brown, and this is The Forge of Tolkien. How many of you write fan fiction for Tolkien, or paint, or draw, compose music, make Dungeons and Dragons scenarios, create stuffed toys, plush toys? <laughs> Why? Why are you drawn to, as Tolkien would put it, subcreate? within his stories. This is one of the invitations that I have regularly made to my own students in the course that I teach on campus at the University of Chicago. For their final projects, they are invited to answer Tolkien's own invitation to add their hands and minds and hearts to crafting something within the broader scope of his legendarium. And over the years, I've had a wonderful range of projects. I've had a Hobbit mystery play, uh, The Lamps of Arda. Um, the lamps were um, portrayed with uh, these spinning ribbons, right? But the characters were portrayed in the play by the Hobbit children of Sam, who they were doing a birthday party for. <laughs> I've had a rock musical on the fall of Numenor, modeled, I, 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 I rather think, on some of the death metal um, music that has come out of Scandinavia inspired by Tolkien, um, a model UN crisis based on the Council of Elrond, um, more, more, well, less and more successful in the fact that the, the, the students in the class had to recruit their friends who didn't necessarily know the story perfectly well, which you could say is, is the way in which the fellowship themselves encountered the, the problem. Um, we've had row, I've had rowering poems in the style of Beowulf, complete with full alliteration, an art installation creating uh, the experience of the, the trees, the trees of Valinor, the experience of seeing the trees come into sort of blossom um, in the darkness. I've had an illustrated books of stories, book of stories of the queens of Numenor given by Faramir um, on their wedding um, day to Eowyn, now that she's marrying into the family, giving her a model of the women whose lives that she'd be following in the footsteps of. Comic books telling the stories of the loss of the Entwives, um, the story of Arundel told by Sam to his children. Sam, of course, being the great lover of fairy stories, so giving his children a sense of his own love of those stories. Bestiary, copied into manuscript complete with illuminated beasts. Hobbit cookbooks, I've had lots of those because typically at the end of the course we have a happening where the students either share their projects like the play or the rock musical. Um, the model UN had to happen somewhere else and then be told of later in, in um, the happening. But the cookbooks, um, I've typically um, asked the students to make things out of their cookbooks so that we can have a great feast. The first year we had dragon tail cake as well as limbus and ice cream made by the um, uh, dar the ring wraiths out of dry ice. <laughs> um, we've had a translation of the Anu Lindale into Cinderin, copied into a handmade book, a set of hobbit toys, um, and this, this, was, this was lovely. It was a set of six stuffed animals with accompanying hobbit poems. The animals were 
uh, creatures that had been mentioned by the hobbits in their own storytelling. So we had a dragon, of course, a white wolf, a spider, an oliphant, tribute to Sam, um, an orc, and a goblin baby. And the the um, crafting of these toys also involved textile history and and stitch, you know, studying the stitches that a hobbit um, craft person would make, or had craft man or woman would use in making these toys, as well as poems going with the creatures. Um, I've had a, 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 a interestingly only one full length role playing adventure. When I get, give people an idea of that that one, which I had the first year, people typically realize that maybe they're not up to crafting an entire hundred page script. Um, uh, we've had the music of creation modeled on Gregorian chant, a working model Grand, the battering ram used against Gondor, a hobbit wedding quilt researched um, on the basis of wedding quilts that were made in the 19th and 20th centuries in America, so these wedding ring quilts, um, book of genealogy, stories of the wizards, stories of the orcs, um, stories about the higher dream, stories about the dwarves, and so on and so on and so on every single year. And I've taught this course now 2005, 2008, 2011, 2014, 2017, 2020, six times. <laughs> Different projects every single time. This year um, we had translations into Portuguese um, of some of the poetry. We had, um, uh, you know, yet more you know lovely stories modeled on Tolkien stories but taking them further a, a novelty for this year was um, a, a story of Arthur right because now we have Tolkien's own fall of Arthur and so something Arthurian for the projects to be modeled on there's clearly going more going on here than simply a desire to be in the story as I talked about last time there's also clearly a desire to be creating within the story where does this desire come from? Now, the letter that I read to you um, at, at the opening just now is one of the most famous letters in um, Tolkien's um, letter collection. It's um, letter 131 to Milton Waldman. And on the one hand, for our purposes, it's, it's the most concise retelling of the whole scope of the legendarium. But within Tolkien's own life, um, it, it holds a significant place because it was the pitch that he was making for his book. <laughs> if you've ever wondered how hard it is to get your stories published, take comfort from the fact that Tolkien had to really struggle at it too. He had published The Hobbit um, first in 1938 with Alan and Unwin, and Alan and Unwin, the publishers, had asked him for more about Hobbits, right? And so from 1938 to by now he's writing this letter in 1951. He it took him some time to write write up um, the Lord of the Rings, and over the course of these these um, lectures, conversations that I'm going to be having with you, I'll be talking about that problem of creating um, the story of the Lord of the Rings. But having completed it, he also, of course, had some more stories <laughs> that he wanted to include with the Lord of the Rings and be published as a single set as I mean maybe not a single volume the Lord of the Rings itself ended up being so long that it was published in three volumes eventually although it is in fact a single book um, but he also wanted to publish some of the stories that we now think of as the Silmarillion I, we, I talked last time about um, the range of stories that that Tolkien actually did write the ones that are included in the Silmarillion are the backstory as it were to the Lord of the Rings, and Tolkien had originally wanted the Silmarillion published together with the Lord of the Rings. And so he wrote this letter um, to Milton Waldman, who was um, an editor not at Allen and Unwin, but at Collins Publishers, because Allen and Unwin had looked at this giant corpus of stories that Tolkien was pressing on them and said, oh, no, thank you. <laughs> so this this letter, letter 131, is Tolkien's effort to convince Milton Waldman to take on the project of publishing his entire legendarium with Collins. Um, Milton Waldman said no, right? So in fact, in, in the long run, Tolkien goes back to Allen and Unwin and they agree to publish just The Lord of the Rings and not The Silmarillion. If you are worrying about getting your stuff published, remember this story. Okay, so. Tolkien, Tolkien writes, um, my dear Milton, this letter in 1931, and he's giving the, the, the logic and the rationale for why Waldman should want to publish the entire Legendarium in a single 
thing, right, in a single set. Um, and to do so, he has to give some justification for where the stories came from, what he thought he was doing in writing them. And that helps us in our, in our question today with saying, well, where, where does Tolkien think this desire for storytelling comes from? And in the letter to Waldman, he gives two um, sources, right? One is his love of language and the other is his love of what he called fairy story, but which probably is more accurately called myth. And I, I want to unpack that a little bit for you, but let's go back to language first, right? What Tolkien says is, and I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, that Tolkien, they, the story sort of came to him, not first as stories, but as the desire to create a story structure within which he could place these invented languages that were his actual hobby, right? And so he, he says, in order of growth, of time, growth, and composition, this stuff began with me. It's typical sort of British underplaying. I mean, it's the, the story of his heart. And he said, well, this stuff, right, this, this mass of legend that I'm pitching to you, this stuff began with me, though I do not suppose that there is much of interest to anyone but myself. Again, this is, don't take him... <laughs> Don't take him at his word here. This is British self-effacing. He's pitching his heart and saying, okay, well, I used to play with languages. I mean, I do not remember a time when I was not building it, right? So there's, that's our, our forge metaphor, this construction that he's involved in. I don't remember a time when I was not building it. It's, it's deep in my memories as something I've always been doing, which is also a, a key to the kind of stories he thinks he's telling, right? These are prime primordial in the sense that they go back before memory and and that's what he's going to try to get access to and the way he gets access to it he's saying is through language many children make up or begin to make up imaginary languages I have been at it since I could write but I have never stopped and of course as a professional philologist especially interested in linguistic aesthetics I have changed in taste improved in theory probably in craft now Again, this is a sort of self-effacing British way of saying things of, I've been doing this since I was young and, I, and since I learned to write, but I'm a professional at it now. And there's, there's a, a sort of movement here in taste, which is an interesting um, gesture to make because he said aesthetics, but taste we'll find out is actually much more deeply embedded in his own thinking than just well, there's no just in aesthetics, right? Aesthetics are really significant for him, but taste improved in theory. So I have actually thought through what it is I'm doing with this linguistic construction. Um, and probably in craft, again, he's been practicing and practicing and practicing. The reason that it took to Christopher so long <laughs> to publish all of those supplemental volumes of Tolkien's edited previous and p p post Lord of the Rings material is he kept writing and writing and rewriting and rewriting, right? So we have taste, theory, and craft, right? That, that this is it, this is highly crafted art with a flavor. Behind my stories is now a nexus of language. Language is mostly only structurally sketched. This is true, right? What we mainly have are etymologies, lists of roots. And, you know, to be able to speak Elvish, you have to go into some sort of, a, you know, uh, you have to invent to a certain extent off the base of those roots. There's not, he wrote, a, you know, their phrases and such in his stories, but what he didn't do was write um, vocabularies. He wrote, he wrote um, etymologies. Um, but to those creatures, which in English I call misleadingly elves, are assigned two related languages more nearly completed, grammatically, as it were, whose history is written and whose forms representing two different sides of my own linguistic taste are deduced scientifically from a common origin. Now look at all of this stuff. This is, this is gonna keep happening, I hope, as I'm reading with you, that he's packing in all sorts of claims here, right? That this is, it's aesthetic, it's about flavor, it's about my sensibilities, my personal preferences, my personal aesthetic joy that I take in these languages, and it's scientific. Right, so this twinning of art and science is is extremely important. Taste and craft, art and science. Out of these legends are made nearly all the names. Out of these, excuse me, out of these languages are made nearly all the names that appear in my legends. Right, and 
I know many of you like world building and, and, and crafting and so forth, but one of the things that, from my experience, instantaneously gives away most fantasy authors when they say that they're engaged in world building is their names suck, right? <laughs> they don't understand the linguistic and philological basis that Tolkien was working from, and so their names feel like they've just been sort of jammed together without any real understanding of the way language works. And because Tolkien could do this, he can go from Elvish to Hobbit, Hobbitish, right, Western, you know, what feels like seamlessly, but you, but you, you are realizing that at every level of his stories, at every language that he's giving the characters that he's created, there's this depth of scientific philology as well as the aesthetic understanding. So he means it, right? Um, this gives a certain character, a cohesion, a consistency of my linguistic style, an illusion of historicity to the nomenclature, or so I believe. Right? Don't believe him. He, he means, he really means that he's given this historicity to the nomenclature because the languages themselves have history, and because the languages have history, the stories feel rooted. That's a, that's a philological term, right? They have roots in the language. Um, that is markedly lacking in other comparable things. Everybody else who tries to write fantasy falls into something that's not history, but fill in the blank. We'll get to that in a second. Nor all will feel this as important as I do since I am cursed by acute sensibility in such matters. Well, yes, cursed, but also blessed because if we feel that his stories have depth, it's because he's working with this sense of language. Now, I, I'm gesturing at a lot of different things and I'm hoping to unpack these in more detail over, over the course of this, this series. But the, the thing that he's talking about here with taste is extremely important. And he has some other um, essays that he talks in more depth. They're, they're um, collected in The Monsters and the Critics. And one of them is his essay on English and Welsh, where he's talking about, among other things, his love of the sounds in the different languages. The, this is the essay where he talks about that, that famous cellar door, the, 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 the sound of the words, the phonemes is what gives it taste. Um, but for our purposes right now, what, what really matters is his sense of language as, as giving roots, not just to this historical sensibility, but also to whole cultures, right? And um, I know there's out there in the interwebs, because of course there is, because of course there always is right now, um, murmurings or, sh you know, shouting from the rooftops of, of headlines, um, these claims that Tolkien is racist. Well, Tolkien himself <laughs> was very, very specifically not racist because he understood the way in which language is the gird, the, the the sort of super, the, the super, which, which metaphor I'm going to use, he built, culture is built on language. And he says this um, specifically in his essay on, on English and Welsh, and, and he's he's talking specifically about this this thing that he gestured to in, in, in the letter about Celticness, right? It's like, I, I wanted to have the air of Celticness, but not quite Celtic, that he's upset with the way in which, um, people misunderstand the relationship between what we would say now soil and soil and, and tongue, but the way in which people feel rooted, that's a agricultural metaphor, obviously, in the languages that they grew up with and how languages in his understanding seem to fit with particular climates. That is not the same thing as saying they are racial in the way in which people love trying to claim that either Tolkien was or Western civilization is is now um, because he very specifically argues that language, and here I'm quoting from him, and I want you to remember this, qu quoting from his essay on language in Welsh, language is the prime differentiator of peoples. And he would mean there what we, what we would talk about in the unauthorized conversations as nations, right? Language is the prime differentiator of peoples, aka nations, not of races. And he puts little quotes around races. Like, language is the prime differentiator of peoples, not of races, whatever that must misused word may mean in the long blended history of Western Europe. 
Languages are the chief distinguishing marks of peoples. No people, in fact, comes into being until it speaks a language of its own. Let the languages perish and the people perish too, or become different peoples. But that never happens except as the result of oppression and distress." End quote. And there, Tolkien was quoting the words of a little-known Icelander of the early 19th century, Sierra Thomas Semundsson. Languages are the chief distinguishing marks of people, that's Semundsson. And Tolkien is, is reinforcing this idea. So when he says he's writing a mythology for England, what you should hear is a mythology for English, right? Because as he goes on to his second characteristic, what he, he was grounding his storytelling, his own storytelling on is his love of languages and these invented languages that he made that root his stories and give them a kind of historicity. Because there was no such literature in English, right? And it's, it's extraordinarily important to understand that he means this philologically, right? He means when he says a mythology for England, he means a mythology told in the language of England, Angleland, the land of the English speaking people. So he's still, con he's still explaining to Waldman and, and he's, he's told him about his love for languages. And now he's going to say, and there's another thing, quote, but an equally basic passion of mine, Abednizio, interesting that he plays, he throws in a little Latin from there, right? Okay, Abednizio from the beginning was for myth. Abednizio for myth in the beginning, right? It's like, I, I, I am so enjoying reading these for you because I get to go really, really slowly and chew over them and meditate on them and realize how crafty <laughs> Tolkien constantly is. Not allegory. For myth, not allegory. That's always the, I want it to be history, not allegory, and you want to be thinking about why he doesn't like allegory. And for fairy story, and above all, for heroic legend on the brink of fairy tale and history, right? That's really what he wants. He wants this legend on the brink of fairy tale and history. And of which there is far too little in the world accessible to me for my appetite, meaning, oh, I've learned all these languages and I can't find it because of course one of the things that he did in, with his love of language is spend his whole life learning new languages and then creating them. So philologically he's doing it on the basis of his reading in many multiple other languages and saying I haven't found it. Okay. I was an undergraduate before, before thought and experience revealed to me that these were not divergent interests, opposite poles of science and romance, but intricately related. Again, arts and science, so this, this fusing of knowledge this the, the the knowledge and craft the, the the philology and the romance i am not learned he uses the quotes footnote with asterisks you think i talk parenthetically wait till i keep reading you token okay i am not learned asterisks though i have thought about them a great deal <laughs> in the matters of myth and fairy story however for in such things as far as known to me I have always been seeking material, things of a certain tone and air, and not simple knowledge. Also, and here I hope I shall not sound absurd, I was from early days grieved by the poverty of my own beloved country. It had no stories of its own, bound up with its tongue and soil, not of the quality that I sought and found as an ingredient in legends of other lands. Okay, so there he's saying, what I'm missing for England is stories bound up with this place, but he means it in this sort of atmospheric way, right? And I think, I think quite possibly what he's doing here, this is a, a sort of literary practice, a literary theorizing in the 19th century, and well, maybe it's, it's more of a practice than a theory, of giving your characters um, re you know, richness by rich um you know deeply describing the the atmosphere of the rooms that they find them in or the landscape or something so this twinning of landscape and character of geography and um sense and th that is what tolkien means with this tongue and soil he means language situated history and time all right or, sorry time and space in history right so he means language situated stories in place 
and and he's grieving that England, unlike other regions, doesn't have its own stories. More Tolkien. There was Greek and Celtic and Romance, Germanic, Scandinavian and Finnish, which greatly affected me, but nothing English, save impoverished chapbook stuff, right? So he's saying basically, I couldn't find anything that I liked that I thought was resonant of England in the way the mythologies, the fairy stories, the heroic legends that I found in Greek and Celt and Welsh and um, Spanish, Italian, French, um, German, the Germanic language, Scandinavian languages, and Finnish. He couldn't find anything in English. Of course, there was and is all the Arthurian world, but powerful it is as it is, it is imperfectly naturalized, associated with the soil of Britain, but not with English, and does not replace what I felt to be missing. Now, so it is interesting that we now have his fall of Arthur, which is obviously Arthurian, but he's saying something about, I wanted to write something for England, but Arthur just didn't seem English, right? It didn't, that, that, didn't, that didn't satisfy what I felt could have been there. And my sense of it is, my personal sense, Professor Rachel Fulton Brown's personal sense is um, it, it, it's he wanted something that was had been conveyed in Old English, right? Beowulf, like Beowulf. And the Arthurian stories don't come to us from Old English. They come to us um, from um, Latin originally, Geoffrey of Monmouth, and then retellings in French and and these other languages so that, you know, by the time you get the Mort d'Arthur uh, Mallory in the 15th century, it is in English literature, but it's not originally English. It doesn't have that philological grounding that Tolkien was looking for. Um, for one thing, it's fairy, technical term for Tolkien, is too lavish and fantastical, incoherent and repetitive. For another and more important thing, and, and this is very interesting for Tolkien to say, it is involved in and explicitly contains the Christian religion. Now that is fascinating because you would think given what I said last time about Tolkien's desire to have a gospel <laughs> and to find yourself inside the story of the gospels that the thing he would want most is a, a literature that was Christian um, but that you know here and I think you do take Tolkien at his word but you have to dig into his words to figure out what he's talking about the, the Arthurian stories as far as he was concerned was concerned didn't have this richness this resonance for England that he found in the old English literature now that for me is deliciously ironic because most of what we in fact have in old English is Christian <laughs> um, and I did a I did a, a episode for my um, medieval history 101 series for unauthorized it's episode number 12 on one of the old English poems that Tolkien was deeply um, inspired by the Arendel um, poem from the Advent lyrics. D again, Tolkien's being a little disingenuous here saying he doesn't want, he doesn't like the Arthurian stories because they're too Christian because he's in fact inspired by the old English literature of, of, of Christians, right? It's written by Christians. And yet he's, he's, he feels like he wants his own mythology to somehow be about Arendelle without it being Arthurian. I think he just feels like the Arthurian stories are not mythological enough. That that fairy that he says he doesn't like. He says it's it's fairy is too lavish. It's I think they weren't Christian enough. Which is a bit of a tease, right? So why not just write Christian myths? How many of you think Christianity is a little mythological. Now, if you do and you think that's a good thing, then don't put me on pause. Keep listening. <laughs> but it has been one of the great challenges that modernity has made to Christianity and in infamously um, not by the internet, because the internet's good at, at repeating stuff that previously has been hashed out by scholars, um, but by one of the most important um, Protestant theologians of the, mid, the early 20th century, mid 20th century, um, Rudolf Bultmann. Um, and he's, Bultmann is famous for his argument that in order to be appealing to the modern person, 
Christianity needed to be demythologized, right? And um, he has an essay that he published in 1940, it's around the time that Tolkien is, is working on The Lord of the Rings. Bultmann pub publishes this essay um, uh, called um, New Testament and Mythology, the problem of demythologizing the New Testament proclamation. And here I'm working off of a blog post that I did um, about the, the problem of Christian mythology in the spiritual life, but I, I have this passage, and it, so if you want to, to see it, it's, it's there. Um, the things that Bultmann complained about are the things that people often complain about in looking at Christianity. One, Bultmann says, well, it has this mythological world world structure, right? There's heaven, there's earth, and there's hell, this weird little tripartite thing. We know heaven and hell don't exist, and there's just earth, and how can you possibly in modernity be expected to believe in something like heaven and hell. Um, but there's also the problem that you have a variety of other characters, creatures in the story. You have angels and demons. Um, you have uh, this pre-existent, this is, this is the, the way um, Bultmann writes, um, that the proclamation of the New Testament talks in mythological language. The last days are at hand when the time had fully come, God sent his son. The Son, a pre-existent divine being, appears on earth as a man. His death on the cross, which he suffers as a sinner, makes atonement for the sins of men. This, this Boltman includes in the mythology of Christianity, right? This is the mythological thing that he's saying is the problem. Um, his resurrection is the beginning of the cosmic catastrophe through which the death brought into the world by Adam is annihilated. The demonic powers of the world have lost their power. The risen one has been exalted to heaven at the right hand of God. He has been made Lord and King. He will return on the clouds of heaven in order to complete the work of salvation. Then will take place the resurrection of the dead and the last judgment. Finally, sin, death, and all suffering will be done away, and this will happen at any moment. Paul supposes that he himself will live to experience this event. Now, what, I mean, what's interesting is, of course, what Bultmann goes on to do in this essay is try to find out a way that you can be Christian and theological without accepting the mythology. But the, the you know, the sense, once you realize that Christianity has this magnificent mythology, we, we, why aren't we all writing stories within this legendarium? Why aren't we all talking about heaven and, and hell and the angels and demons? and the you know the, the incarnation of the son of god to become king oh maybe we actually always are i mean one of the the sort of fascinating and interesting things about this this desire to get rid of myth is that it keeps coming back every superhero story ever participates in a way in this savior story right in this salvation story now whether the savior comes from heaven like superman or is not really um, uh, divine, like Batman, right? One way or the other, what is really fascinating and interesting is we, we do inhabit these myths, but we get kind of curiously sort of nervous about making other kinds of claims about them. And I'm you know, saying, ask, asking you in this, this episode to be thinking with me about your own desire to write fan fiction, right? Your own desire to write science fiction stories, your own desire to write fantasy stories, your own desire to write fairy stories. How much of it is this desire to be inside? Well, what? What are you wanting to be inside of when you want to be inside a mythological framework? Well, myth has a sense of making real things that we would otherwise consider metaphorical and there's something there's something really significantly different here in the way in which you create that that sense of it being real, right? You need it to be real. And the best way to, to tip, typically the best way to understand these kinds of things is to look at a contrast, right? And the contrast that Tolkien regularly invokes, everybody knows that he invokes this. He always says it. He says it in the preface to The Lord of the Rings, how he always liked 
history, but not allegory, right? And he and he, he says this in the letter um, to to Waldman um, that he um, these stories grew in his mind. We've been talking about that. Um, he made some up, he says, some escaped from the grasp of this large branching acquisitive theme, this legendarium that he's crafting, and they turn into other accessory stories that don't really belong in the Silmarillion, like Leaf by Niggle or Farmer Giles of Ham, um, The Hobbit, but he didn't realize that it belonged when he started it. But it proved to be, The Hobbit, he says, um, was quite independently conceived. I did not know as I began it that it belonged, but it proved to be the discovery of the completion of the whole, its motive, descent to earth, emerging into history, right? So he's been writing all these stories. He wants to write fairy story. He wants to write heroic legend, and he can't figure out how to make it complete until he writes The Hobbit, and The Hobbit has the key. Because the Hobbit is the descent to Earth, right? Okay, now we suddenly realize he's thinking in this vast legendarium mytholo mythology that Christianity is grounded in the, the 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 you know the bringing of the heavenly to Earth, right? The elves aren't really heavenly, but what are they, right? But you need the Hobbits to bring this into history. As the high legends of the beginning are supposed to look at things through elvish minds, so the middle tale of the Hobbit takes a virtually human point of view and the last tale blends them, right? So he's trying to blend somehow the, the heavenly, the, the, the elvish, and the human, the hobbitish. And in his Silmarillion, he had all these elvish stories and the Hobbit, the, narr the, the, the original children's book, brought the hot, you know, the sort of brought something grounded, earthy, brought it down to earth and was able to make it history. And the Lord of the Rings can participate in that because it's wedding, elvish and hobbitish. But it's, and then instantaneously, I, right after he said this, um, you know, I, I, I've merged into history. I dislike allegory. The conscious and intentional allegory, yet any attempt to explain the purport of myth or fairy tale must use allegorical language. Okay, now he's in this bind, right? Because he realizes, I'm trying to talk to you about myth. I'm trying to talk to you about meaning. And I don't want it to be allegorical. I don't want it to be, and I probably should do a whole episode just on this problem of allegory, but he doesn't want it to be something that you sort of take this key and unlock it and there's the answer, poof, it's gone, right? There's something about myth fusing with history that you see that you can't see when it's it's simply allegory and then he goes on to give Waldman an explanation of what his story is actually about mainly concerned with fall mortality in the machine with fall inevitably and that motive occurs in several modes with mortality especially as it affects art and the creative or as I should say sub creative technical term Desire, which seems to have no biological function and to be apart from the satisfactions of plain, ordinary biological life and to be apart from this, sorry, and which in our world is, it, it, excuse me, to be apart from the satisfactions of plain, ordinary biological life with which in our world it is indeed usually at strife. This desire is at once wedded to a passionate love of the real primary world and hence filled with a sense of mortality and yet unsatisfied by it. It has various opportunities of fall. It may become possessive, clinging to the things made as its own. The sub-creator wishes to be the Lord of God, the Lord God of his private creation. He will rebel against the laws of the creator, especially against mortality. Both of these alone or together will lead to the desire for power, for making the will more quickly effective, and so to the machine or magic. By the last, okay, now he's gone into magic. The, the, let's go back and he's just, he's just giving you the, the myth, right? The fall, creation, mortality, redemption. This is a Christian story. Even though he's just told you in the previous paragraph or so above that he doesn't like <laughs> he doesn't like the Arthurian stories because they're too Christian and yet the entire structure 
of the story that he's been working with with the elves and the hobbits and the men and the and the melding of myth and history is in fact itself inevitably this christian story now that doesn't make it allegory and it does it makes it as as he says um in on fairy stories um as we talked about last time, this this eucatastrophe, right? That the fairy story contains a eucatastrophe, and what he hopes he's writing is something that contains this kind of eucatastrophe, this this turn from sorrow to joy, and that the great eucatastrophe, the Christian joy, is of the same kind that you find in these fairy stories. But the the Christian, and and he's. I usually have to get you to these places where he's he's saying it so beautifully, but um, he's saying that this joy would be the same as in a, in a fairy story, um, but the Christian joy, the Gloria, um, is preeminently, infinitely, if our capacity were not finite, high and joyous. But this story, the gospel, is supreme and it is true. I mean, Bultmann, whatever, I mean, Tolkien was probably aware of Bultmann, most likely. And, and the sort of theorizing that he's doing here is a theological theorizing about the problem of myth making and the problem of pl the place of myth in Christian understanding and, and the Christian sense of joy, right? And and here he's he's coming right out and and insisting, although I'm very this is 1936, so maybe he's not directly responding to Boltman, but he's responding to a, a problem that. Christians have in modernity of what do we do with the mythology, right? Um, this story is supreme and it is true. Art has been verified. Myth is art. Myth is creation and science. Somehow, uh, you realize how all of these, what we're learning to do is think analogically and metaphorically, and we'll be unpacking that. Um, art has been verified. God is the Lord of angels and of men and of elves, legend and history have met and fused. So we need it to be historical. We need it to be real. And we need this sense of creativity, which is both an art and a science, to be somehow participating in that making. Well, how are we going to accomplish that? This was Tolkien's great project. It was also, of course, the project of him and his friends, the Inklings, who famously met during um, the 30s, the 20s and 30s, um, at the Oxford pub, the, the Eagle and Child, um, in typical British fashion, they gave it a nickname, so it's the bird and the baby. Um, they would meet at the pub on um, Tuesdays, and then on Thursdays they would meet in Lewis's rooms in Maudlin College to share stories and to talk about this problem of art. Um, you know, so, but they're all, they're, they're, many of them professors, not all of them were professors. I mean, Lewis and, and Tolkien were, and another important character in today's story, Hugo Dyson, um, was also a professor, but not at Oxford until somewhat later than, than he was meeting with them as Inklings. Uh, but others of the people who met with the Inklings weren't professors. There was um, Lewis's own brother, um, whose name I'm blanking on. You all can tell me in the comments. Um, and even more important for our long-term purposes, Owen Barfield, who was a lawyer, um, but wrote some of the most important theorizing that Tolkien and Lewis used for understanding what they were doing with language and poetry, right? And the sort of reality of this naming that they're involved in in, in the course of their um, crafty, world crafting, right? Their world building is a process of naming. One night, three of these friends, um, Lewis, Tolkien, and Hugh Dyson had met together at Maudlin College um, for dinner, um, Lewis and, and Lewis, where Lewis was, was um, teaching, and they famously took a stroll on the college grounds along Addison's Walk. And in the course of this conversation, at least as Tolkien remembered it, uh, Lewis has some versions of it that, that match with Tolkien's 
retelling and others that point in other directions. But in the course of this conversation, Lewis converted to Christianity. <laughs> That's the, the short version of it. And um, Tolkien remembered this. He, he mentions it on fairy stories that he had been trying to persuade a friend that mythology was actually significant, not just lies, right? And and Lewis apparently had used this this phrase of that it was lies. The mythology was lies breathed through silver and Tolkien wanted to convince Lewis that no mythology was actually the key to the mystery that they were trying to unlock not just as storytellers but theologically as Christians and in order to answer Lewis Tolkien went home and wrote a poem um, he in fact m wrote and rewrote it many times Christopher found seven drafts of it um, but it, it's a poem about the problem of crafting and um, making by way of poetry. <laughs> um, if, if you're curious and want to sort of join my own little inkling group, I call it the Dragon Common Room, and it's my chat on Telegram, and we're actually practicing right now uh, the very verse form that Tolkien wrote this poem in, which is iambic pentameter, um, the meter of heroic um legends in English, um, written in heroic couplets um, like Alexander Pope used to write. If you know a little learning is a dangerous thing, you know one of Pope's lines. Um, so that Tolkien is giving the form to his argument, the, the aesthetic form to his argument, the, the, the linguistic and, and um, breathed form to his argument that he wants to prove, right? So there's a twinning here beautifully of art and logos. Logos may be rising, and I do agree with with um, Professor uh, with Professor with Dr. Jones on that, right? Logos is rising, but but we need to recognize that Logos rises with beauty. Logos rises with craft and art and making things. With Tolkien would say accepting the invitation to subcreate. So this is the poem, and I think I'm probably going to read it to you now and then spend the next episode um, of, of our meditations here talking, talking you through it. But I want to leave it with you now and I want you to, to listen to it and chew over it um, between this episode and the next, all right? So here we have Mythopoeia. To one who said that myths were lies and therefore worthless, even though breathed through silver, philomythos to mesomythos. You look at trees and label them just so, for trees are trees, and growing is to grow. You walk the earth and tread with solemn pace one of the many minor globes of space. A star is a star, some matter in a ball, compelled to courses mathematical. Amid the regimented cold inane, where destined atoms are each, at, are each moment slain. At bidding of a will, to which we bend and must but only dimly apprehend, great processes march on as time unrolls from dark beginnings to uncertain goals, as on page or written without clue with script and limning packed of various hue, an endless multitude of forms appear, some grim, some frail, some beautiful, some queer, each alien except as kin from one remote origo, gnat, man, stone, and sun. God made the petrous rocks, the arboreal trees, Tellurian earth and stellar stars, and these homuncular men who walk upon the ground with nerves that tingle touched by light and sound, the movements of the sea, the wind and boughs, green grass, the large, slow oddity of cows, thunder and lightning, birds that wheel and cry, slime crawling up from mud to live and die, these each are duly registered and print the brain's contortions with a separate dent. Yet trees are not trees, until so named and seen, and never were so named, till those had been whose speech's involuted breath unfurled faint echo and dim picture of the world, but neither record nor a phonograph, being divination, judgment, and a laugh, response of those that felt a stir within by deep munition movements that were kin to life and death of trees, of beasts, of stars, free captives, undermining shadowy bars, 
digging the foreknown from experience and panning the vein of spirit out of sense. Great powers they slowly brought out of themselves and looking backwards, they beheld the elves that wrought on cunning forges in the mind and light and dark on secret looms entwined. He sees no stars who does not see them first of living silver made that sudden burst to flame like flowers beneath an ancient song whose very echo after music long has since pursued. There is no firmament, only a void, unless a jeweled tent, myth-woven and elf-patterned, and no earth, unless the mother's womb, whence all have birth. The heart of man is not compound of lies, but draws some wisdom from the only wise and still recalls him. Though now long estranged, man is not wholly lost, nor wholly changed, disgraced he may be yet is not dethroned, and keeps the rags of lordship once he owned his world dominion by creative act, not his to worship the great artifact, man's sub-creator, the refracted light through whom is splintered from a single white to many hues and endlessly combined in living shapes that move from mind to mind. Though all the crannies of the world we filled with elves and goblins, though we dared to build gods and their houses out of dark and light, and sow the seeds of dragons, twas our right, used or misused, the right has not decayed. We make still by the law in which we are made. Yes, wish fulfillment dreams we spin to cheat our timid hearts and ugly fact defeat. Whence came the wish and whence the power to dream, where some things fair and others ugly deem? All wishes are not idle, nor in vain fulfillment we devise, for pain is pain, nor for itself to be desired but ill, or else to strive or to subdue the will, alike were graceless, and of evil this alone is deadly certain evil is. Blessed are the timid hearts that evil hate, that quail in its shadow and yet shut the gate, that seek no parley and in guarded room, though small and bare upon a clumsy loom, weave tissues gilded by the far-off day, hoped and believed in under shadows sway. Blessed are the men of Noah's race that build their little arks, though frail and poorly filled, and steer through winds contrary towards a wraith, a rumor of harbor guessed by faith. Blessed are the legend makers with their rhyme of things not found within recorded time. It is not they that have forgot the night or bid us flee to organized delight in lotus isles of economic bliss for swearing souls to gain a Circe kiss and counterfeit at that machine produced bogus seduction of the twice seduced. Such isles they see afar and ones more fair and those that hear them yet may be, yet may yet beware. They have seen death and ultimate defeat, and yet they would not in despair retreat, but off to victory have turned the lyre, and kindled hearts with legendary fire, illuminating now, and dark hath been with lights of sun as yet by no man seen. I would that I might with the minstrels sing and stir the unseen with a throbbing string. I would be with the mariners of the deep that cut their slender planks on mountain steep and voyage upon a vague and wandering quest for some have passed beyond the fabled west. I would with the beleaguers fools be told that keep an inner fastness where their gold impure and scanty yet they loyally bring to mint an image blurred of distant king or in fantastic banners weave the sheen heraldic emblems of lord unseen. I will not walk with your progressive apes, erect and sapient, before them gapes the dark abyss to which their progress tends, if by God's mercy progress ever ends and does not ceaselessly revolve the same unfruitful course with changing of a name. I will not tread your dusty path and flat, denoting this and that by this and that, your world immutable, wherein no part the little maker has with maker's art. 
I bow not yet before the iron crown, nor cast my own small golden scepter down. In paradise, perchance the eye may stray from gazing upon everlasting day to see the day illumined and renew from mirrored truth the likeness of the true. Then looking on the blessed land, we'll see that all is as it is and yet made free. Salvation changes not, nor yet destroys garden nor gardener, children nor their toys. Evil it will not see, for evil lies not in God's picture, but in crooked eyes, not in the source, but in malicious choice, and not in sound, but in the tuneless voice. In paradise they look no more awry, and though they make anew, they make no lie. Be sure they still will make, not being dead, and poets shall have flames upon their head, and harps whereon their faultless fingers fall. There each shall choose forever from the all. I think, you see I get choked up when I do this. And I have to drink. Because the reality of language and the reality that we come to these stories with is that they are creations of an embodied mind and you have to say them with your voice. <laughs> so you have to say them with your body, you have to say them out loud. I invite you to spend this next week reading Tolkien's invitation to create and to continue meditating on why you might want to take on that invitation to create. And next time we will continue to explore how Tolkien in fact wrote not just a mythology for England, but the mythology of Christ. Thank you so much for joining me. I will see you next time.